If you've had our BriFight workshop before, and I know some of you have, this will be a review of some of the things that we have talked about in uh, Jepson workshops before. The, these are all aspects in which bryophytes are considerably different than vascular plants. And when we present bryophyte biology, one thing we try to convince people of is just how different bryophytes are from vascular plants. They're not just small vascular plants. They have their own complete way of being a land plant. Marked with an asterisk are the most important things for what we're talking about today. I'm gonna to show you the life cycle just as a refresh in a minute, but the uh, vegetative plant that we're looking at is haploid. So its chromosome situation is like the gametes of metazoa, such as ourselves. There's only one set of chromosomes in the vegetative plant, and that does have you know, various effects on the population genetics and various other aspects. There's a lot of phenotypic plasticity, which we're not gonna to emphasize today, but it's uh, definitely a feature of their biology. One thing we are gonna emphasize a lot today is this concept of poikilohydry. And it's sister uh, concept of desiccation tolerance. They're not necessarily the same thing. Poikilohydry means adjusting your water content inside an organism directly to the water content that's in the environment. And the poikilo comes from Greek for changing. And this is the same root. If you remember from biology, you talk about poikilothermic animals like a snake or a lizard. A poikilothermic animal is one that adjusts its body temperature pretty much to match the environment that it's in. So poikilohydry is the same root it's opposed to homeohydry, which is what the vascular plants do, where they have internal conduction, they have cuticles, and they try to maintain their water content higher inside than outside. These plants are characterized by pretty much following the water content that's all around them. If you're going to be a poikilohydric plant or animal, there are poikilohydric animals as well. If you're going to be a poikilohydric organism, Unless you live in the water, you better be desiccation tolerant. You better be able to handle getting dry and coming back. And we're going to talk a lot about that. Centricia always has been a model system organism for studying this. Mel Oliver has made his career on looking at various aspects of desiccation tolerance. And uh, it's certainly a major feature of the group. Another really important area we're going to be talking about today is the water out in the environment is not only needed for basic physiology, but it's needed for sexual reproduction. Another difference between the bryophytes and angiosperms would be the angiosperms have internalized their reproduction quite a bit and they have pollen and they have flowers with ovules in them. And the gametes don't need to swim between the male and the female. Pollinator brings the male basically to the female and the gametes in angiosperms only have a very short distance to travel, and that's inside the uh, flower in an internal environment. So they've essentially internalized reproduction, whereas the bryophytes have swimming sperm. They need to have water for the sperm to get from the male to the female. There are um, aspects which we won't spend a lot of time on, but they live together in clumps mosses particularly more than liverworts and their biology is highly influenced by that. Uh, finally, um, asect reproduction is the last thing we'll be talking about quite a bit. Kirsten will be talking about the implications of that for the population genetics. These mosses, Centricia and most other mosses, they do have trouble making the contact between the male and the female. So they rely on asex reproduction for a huge amount of their spread in, in the environment. Uh, microhabitats, small organisms experience the environment differently than large organisms do. This is true for salamanders and mosses. They just perceive the environment differently than uh, let's say birds and flowering plants would. The um, in many cases in these dryland habitats, the available environment is that the moss could grow in is not full. 
that the moss is having trouble with establishment. So a lot of the selection pressures are not in dry land situations are not so much competing with other mosses or other genotypes as trying to deal with the physical environment. A combination of some of these features, uh, something we don't fully understand, but is abundantly true if you look at mosses in the fossil record, is that they, at least at the morphological level, they uh, tend to evolve uh, very slowly. Probably at the physiological level, though, as we'll show, they evolve pretty fast. But um, mosses, as you look back on the fossil record, are pretty much the same from, you know, all through the uh, Mesozoic and Cenozoic. So many of these moss groups are actually quite old, and at least at the morphological superficial level are pretty similar to their uh, ancestors. Okay, so just a reminder, many of you know this, but just to be sure everybody's uh, on board, the transition from land, from water to land in the green plants was a story of going from aquatic algae, which are entirely haploid, they only have a single cell diploid, which is their zygote, that's after they get fertilization, through an intermediate situation in the bryophytes where there is both a sporophyte and a haploid, and a, uh, a diploid sporophyte and a haploid gametophyte, transitioning through ferns, which still have a free living gametophyte, and if you've ever grown ferns, you've seen these little prothalia, but most of the fern life cycle is spent as a diploid. To the seed plants, and then particularly the angiosperms, as I mentioned, the gametophyte generation has been captured by the sporophyte and doesn't actually get out in the environment at all. So the whole life cycle is uh, carried out by the uh, diploid. So this turnover from haploid to diploid in land plant evolution as a big picture is we're kind of right in the middle of it with the bryophytes. We have haploid vegetative plants and then we have diploid uh, spore producing plants. Just a quick um, image. I have one little video here I got from Mel. This is uh, the same exact clump of moss that's just water has been put on part of it and they come back very fast, which Kirsten Coe is going to be talking about. They recover extremely fast from being re-wetted, just a matter of minutes and uh, they're back in action. Let me show you this uh, video that Mel gave me. This is not sped up, this is real time. This is a centricia laying on a towel with uh, a pipette of water added to it, not sped up. So just in those few seconds, it's breaking a kind of dormancy and it's beginning its physiology in a remarkable way that, um, that really none of the vascular plants do. A few of the vascular plants are poikiohydric and desiccation tolerant, but uh, they take much longer than this. Like the uh, polypodes you're probably familiar with on the trees, they won't, they'll wet up over a day, but they won't wet up this quickly. There we go. I also got the slide from Mel. So Mel, I probably should have had you give this. But here's the definition of poikilohydry again. And here's the definition of desiccation tolerance again. And as I say, they're related terms, but they're not synonymous with each other. Poikilohydry just refers to how you're dealing with water. Is it just coming in and out of the organism uh, rapidly? And then desiccation tolerance is, are the physiological mechanisms that allow you to uh, survive doing that. Kirsten Co will be going back into this in more detail, but think of the life of the centricia as being uh, like windows of time when it's active. And most of the time it is completely inactive and inert. So it experiences life as a series of vignettes, you know, we all kind of feel that way these days with COVID that's like, you know, life is just happening as a series of vignettes, but it's really true for uh, centricias. They're dry, they get water, they go through a phase where they're actually um, 
negatively, their carbon balance is negative. They're actually losing more carbon than they're getting. So phase A here is not a good phase, but they can recover from that and they enter a phase where they are photosynthesizing, they're gaining carbon, packing it away and uh, for growth and reproduction and things. And then after a period of time, they start to dry out again. And then they go into another phase, phase C, where they're uh, negatively, uh, their carbon balance is negative. The, what the moss would be trying to do through natural selection would be to have this phase be as big as possible and those phases be as small as possible. And the kind of factors that affect the cycle and the ability of the moss to recover there's at least four of these that our, our group has um, tested experimentally. The, the rate that they dry turns out to have an effect on what they'll do after they recover. How, you can think of this second one is how deeply do they dry? Do they dry really, really dry or do they maintain a partial uh, water content because they're in humid air? That makes a difference. How long they are dry, are they dry for weeks or months or years has an effect. And then the rate at which they rehydrate um, would also have an effect. Um, so the rates are important. This is not a, uh, you know, a stereotyped game. There's lots of things varying through the moss and the different uh, habitats and the different morphologies and so forth make a difference to this. And Kirsten Co. will be going back into the, this physiological area in detail. This slide up in uh, the figure in the upper right, I stole from Kirsten Fisher, uh, some of the population genetic results. But here is the life cycle again, just to remind you that below the line here is our haploid phase. This is the main phase that we're talking about in the field. The, um, gamma tangier produced in this phase, fertilization happens. And once you have a fertilized zygote, which is the first diploid cell, that grows into this other generation, the sporophyte generation. And eventually that will, through meiosis, produce spores. In most of what we're talking about today, we're gonna to be talking about uh, the gametophyte, but we are interested in the distribution of the male and female gamma tangia. And Kirsten's going to, Kirsten Fisher will be talking some about that. We are interested in the uh, crossing and in fertilization and sporophytes as well. We have uh, two different terms that we'll be throwing around here. We have mon monoicus and dioicus, which we use instead of monoecious and dioecious because they're referring to the haploid plant. There are species of centrichia that have the sexes on the same individual. And there are other species of centrichia that have the sexes on different individuals. Those are the dioicus ones. So monoicus, male and female inflorescence is on the same plant. Dioicus, they're on different plants. And that of course has a big effect on their ability to make crosses and their ability to um, you know, sexually reproduce. And then I'm um, almost done here. This is uh, asexual reproduction. This is actually two different species of centrichia. This one here is centrichia pagorum. This one here is centrichia papillosa. You can notice some morphological differences between them, right? This has, um, and they have different kind of gemmy. These are little round gemmies that are born on the leaf surface. Whereas pagorum has evolutionarily modified leaves that occur in specialized shoots. But in both of these cases, and these are not too closely related to each other, and there are many other examples of um, asexual reproductive bodies produced by these. And if this wasn't enough, I put a blender in here to represent the fact that every single one of the centrichias will regenerate if it's just broken to pieces. So the leaves will just grow uh, new plants. A common way we propagate it is to put the plant in a blender and it will, um, it will just produce uh, scads of uh, new plants. They do not need spores for sure to reproduce. Most of their reproduction we think occurs in one of these asexual modes. And then finally, 
I think this picture is going to show up in a couple of the other talks exactly the same exact picture. But the just to introduce the role of centrichia at the ecosystem level, there's your centrichia. You see the star moss in there. But along with other players, other mosses and lichens, blue green bacteria form this really interesting community called the biocrust, which at the end of the day today, Matt is going to talk about in detail. And this is a very important uh, community for the overall ecosystem, not just for the small plants, but also for the big plants. Some of you, I think, went on this uh, Jepson Crust walk that we did back in July 2018 up in Tilden. We had a, a good time there looking at the soil crust communities. And then there's some pictures that I think I stole from Matt that are up along the top of different kinds of uh, the uh, bio crust communities. And we will um, be going into those in a lot of detail later in the day. But I just put them in here to convince you that these centrichias are not just of esoteric interest to a small group of botanists. These are actually mosses that have uh, large scale effects.